This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 61. Recorded on July 31st, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hi there. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good. I'm looking forward to going to Europe for most of the month of August, so you won't hear me. Lucky for a while. you. Lucky you. That's great. I guess you're not going to podcast from Europe, right? No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, we hope you enjoy it. We'll miss you. <laughs> Thank you. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Hey, welcome back. Well, thanks very much. I'm flattered to be invited back. Michelle was with us in Denver. Our listeners may remember. You're at the University of Michigan, Microbiology and Immunology, correct? That's right. The same department as my TWIV co-host, Kathy Spindler. She's a neighbor right on my floor. In fact, you're using the headset that she usually I uses am. for TWIV. So it's got good karma. <laughs> <laughs> you know what else? Um, I did a live TWIV at a meeting last week at Penn State, and we had another one of your colleagues, uh, yes. Christina Vobis. That's right. This Michigan is just full of wonderful people. We're we're smart and we're also good citizens. And <laughs> and you also have you have football too. That's a, such a combination. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Michelle has agreed to now and then come on Twim, right? That's right. To grace us with your uh, science and nice voice too. And and Midwestern sensibility. Lucky us, yeah. lucky us. So we appreciate that. We won't be a burden, but today. Um, I'm glad you could make it at the last minute because we have a couple of cool papers to talk about and we'd appreciate you joining in the conversation. Uh, we have two papers today to do and the first one I will do, I will start off. It's a paper published in Cell Host and Microbe uh, just this month, July 17th, and it's called Probiotic Bacteria Reduce Salmonella Typhimurium intestinal colonization by competing for iron. And the authors are Dariu Lu, Pezeshki, Edwards, Ochoa, Contreras, Libby, Fang, and Rafatelu. Ferric Fang is the next to the last author who was also with us uh, in Denver. You may recall right. Michelle and Elio. Yeah, he talked about ethical issues of publication. That's right. And I I just love that he's on a paper about iron. <laughs> Ferric. Ferric. He said his mother wanted to call him Ferris, actually. <laughs> yeah, but he says, yeah, I asked him if he has a cousin called Ferris. He says, yes, but he's unstable. <laughs> <laughs> what a great name. And he works on iron. And that's what this paper is about, uh, the battle for iron, as Michael Schmidt would would call it. And this paper is about Salmonella typhimurium, better known, I guess, as Salmonella enterica serovar typhimurium. I guess that's the proper name for it. But uh, this is a big cause of gastroenteritis in people. And um, when you get in, infected or with, uh, with Salmonella T, you know, the inflammation in your gut enhances colonization by this bacteria because... Um, the inflammation provides a unique electron acceptor for the bacterium. And that's the story we talked about uh, on TWIM number 27 ages ago. And that episode was called An Inflamed Gut is Good for Salmonella. So the inflammation produces this electron acceptor. I think it was ethanolamine. And uh, Salmonella loves to use that. So we've talked about... No, that's the donor. It's uh, tetrathionate. Tetrathionate, right. And... Um, it uses that. Hey, you have a good memory there. And what's left of it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and the um, anyway, that's one of the cool stories we did on uh, on Twin before. So this is about salmonella and gut infection and iron. So 
just to give a little background, when bacteria are starved for iron, of course, iron is an important component. We need it for many things, including the hemoglobin in our blood and other things as well. And microbes need iron as well. And that's why there's a battle for iron. And when, when microbes need iron, they make these chelators called siderophores. And one of them is enterochelin. It's made by salmonella and commensal E. coli. And this is an attempt to bind up iron so the bacteria can use it. In response, the host, in, a, in this case us, for example, we make a protein called lipocalin 2. And this actually binds enterochelin and prevents it from bringing iron into the bacteria. Now, when you, whenever you have an um, arms race like this, there's always another response. And so some pathogens overcome lipocalin 2, and salmonella is one of them. They make another siderophore that cannot be inhibited by lipocalin 2. And for salmonella... The question comes up, are we going to evolve to make an anti-siderophore yeah, against that? I'm <laughs> sure, and given enough time, right? Yeah, because <laughs> why just uh, lipocalin? Why not others? Yeah. And for humans, the evolution takes a long time, though. Right? Yeah. Uh, probably thousands of years by the time the one person with the protein populates you know the world anyway salmonella's protein its antagonist of lipocalin 2 is called salmochelin and it's actually made by simply glycosylating the substrate for lipocalin oh and, oh so so and, that's an escape mechanism that salmonella has simply added a sugar mm -hmm. and now it can escape binding by the host factor Lipocalin. So it's enterochelin with uh, glycosylation, basically. That's right. See, wow. Glycosylation seems to be a big topic these days. It shows up all over. Mm. All manosylation and stuff like that, mm. and TB and other bugs. So I don't know. Modification of proteins by adding a sugar seems to be a much bigger deal than I was taught. So, Michelle, did that arise just by an amino acid change that allowed? Glycosylation? No, there's actually the enzyme that does the glycosylation is itself encoded on a mobile element uh -huh. that has that spreads as a virulence factor. So it really does fit into this arms race paradigm. Nice. Mm. Clever. Yeah, very clever. All right, so that's the, um, the bacterium here, one of them anyway. And uh, the other part of this story is the probiotic bacterium and has Everyone know we've talked about probiotics on TWIM before. These are microbes, commensal microbes, that are thought to be good for us. Um, and, of course, there's lots of controversy about whether they are or not. One of them, the topic of this paper, is E. coli nissle strain, and N-I-S-S-L-E. And that was isolated in 1917 from a soldier who, during an outbreak of Shigella diarrhea, didn't get sick. So they isolated the strain from that soldier. And since then, 1917, it has been used to treat people with a variety of intestinal or disorders like enteritis. But how it works isn't known. By the way, it occurred to me that uh, one of us has to go back and read the 1917 paper. Yeah. Because in the early days like that, it must have taken quite some insight to figure out that the bug like E. coli could help overcome a disease like uh, Shigella dysentery. I mean, that takes quite an insight, and yeah, I sure. think it's early on. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go back and try to find that paper. That's a good point, because I can't imagine that they would have How this, this idea, out? right? Because yeah. I know back then, this is when Darrell first isolated phages, right? Yeah, right he was trying to study bacteria from soldiers who had uh, diarrhea, and he ended up finding a phage. So it would be interesting to do that. So good idea. Anyway, so the authors of this paper had a, a variety of reasons for thinking that iron might be involved in the um, ability of this strain E. e coli nissle to be beneficial. So that's what this paper is, is about. And in the paper, they use a mouse model of uh, Salmonella typhimurium infection. To, to address this. There are actually two separate mouse strains that are used and they give uh, different outcomes. When you infect mice, one strain of mice with salmonella, the amount of iron in the gut is, is substantially reduced. So in other words, so they actually do an experiment where they infect mice and they show that after uh, infection, iron levels are very much lower. 
So this um, establishes that iron is limited uh, or limited during you know, salmonella infection of mice. So when you feed mice salmonella, the, this particular strain, they shed the bacterium and they develop persistent colitis. So this is a persistent model for infection. It's a particular strain of mice. And what they find is that if you feed the E. coli nissel strain three days later, you substantially reduce colonization uh, by salmonella. So that's the, that's the main observation. You take this mouse model for salmonella. Well, when you feed them salmonella, they become persistently infected. That can be reduced by giving uh, the nissel strain of E. coli. So they ask, is this dependent on the ability of the E. coli strain to acquire iron? So they use a strain with a mutation in a gene. It's called TONB, T-O-N-B. And this mutation uh, interferes with transport of the siderophores that are needed for utilization of iron by the bacterium. All right, same experiment. You infect mice with salmonella, then this E. coli mutant strain. This strain cannot reduce uh, the colonization by salmonella. This, this strain will colonize the mice. It grows in the gut, but it does not reduce, for example, salmonella in the fecal material as does the wild type strain. And it doesn't affect, it doesn't reduce chronic inflammation at all. So it shows that iron acquisition is important for this effect. The authors say... Uh, hold for on the, a second. Yeah. Uh, there's something a little bit peculiar here, namely mm -hmm. the, the Ton B mutant, adding Ton B mutant makes inflammation even worse. Like if there's, there's some synergy with someone else. Yeah. I found that peculiar. Yeah. I don't, did they comment on that? I don't think they I don't knew. remember them commenting on it, no. This is in figure two, if you have the paper in front of you. I do. Now let's take a look at figure two. A. Look at A. Yeah, it goes up, right? It goes up quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, we could probably speculate, but I don't remember them doing that at right. all. Yeah. But the basic fact is that iron acquisition seems to be important for this effect. They call it a probiotic effect of E. coli, at least for mice. I, I would add probiotic effect in mice because we don't know about people at all. All right, so next they use another mouse strain in which the infection is acute. It doesn't persist. So this is their acute uh, mouse model. And they again show that iron uptake, um, so the salmonella colitis again can be reduced uh, by the wild type E. coli nissel, but not iron uptake mutants, uh, even though, again, the strains, the E. coli strains can colonize the mice. So it's the same result in this acute mouse model. Um, they use a salmonella mutant, which has a change in a gene called IRO, capital N, which is a very <laughs> nice way to, to name the gene, iron. Um, and this, this mutant cannot acquire iron via salmochelin, that's siderophore. Um, vi that mutant, I keep wanting to say virus, you know, it's in my brain. That mutant <laughs> bacterium is defective at colonizing mice. And when they add E. coli, it doesn't further reduce colonization by this salmonella mutant. So this shows that competition for iron is, is probably important for the probiotic effect of uh, the E. coli strain. Interestingly, later in infection... E. coli downregulates host lipocalin 2. Huh. And this curiously partially rescues colonization by the iron mutant of, of salmonella. So this lipocalin 2, of course, is, is antagonizing iron levels in the gut. And when that's downregulated, the salmonella does a little bit better. Now, there's a little interesting sidetrack, um, which hasn't, doesn't have to do with iron, but it's worth talking about. Apparently, E. coli nissel can also diminish intestinal inflammation induced by salmonella in, in another way that doesn't have anything to do with iron, but rather the nissel strain can inhibit the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and they can show that in a variety of ways. So the effect of, of this strain on uh, at least salmonella is probably at least twofold. It involves iron and also reducing the, the uh, cytokines that are made. Okay, so back to iron. Next, they take a mouse that is lacking the gene for lipocalin 2. So this is a knockout mice that's mouse that's been made. And they feed this mouse salmonella. And when you do that, there's no effect of the Nissel strain. Okay? So Nissel has no effect on colonization by salmonella in these mice that don't make lipocalin 2. So in other words, the E. coli effects on salmonella colonization somehow involves 
uh, lipocalin 2. And in f- furthermore, it suggests that E. coli nissel is resistant to lipocalin 2. And in fact, they do an experiment where they've deleted multiple iron receptors from this E. coli strain, and deletion of three of them did not give a growth defect in the presence of lipocalin 2. And that shows that the strain does have uh, lipocalin 2 resistant iron uptake mechanisms. So their hypothesis is that this E. coli initial strain has multiple iron uptake mechanisms that give it a competitive advantage against salmonella in conditions where the intestine is inflamed and iron is reduced. And this advantage requires lipocalin 2 from the host. Now, this is kind of interesting because we know that from other work that salmonella, uh, salmochelin can block lipocalin 2. So that is sort of a, a weird observation. And it must be that E. coli initial is better at antagonizing lipocalin 2 than salmonella and can more effectively compete for iron. Uh, I have a question for Michelle. Uh, maybe not much of a question, but um, do you think that all these systems are inducible or are they constitutive? Is there anything known about that? Um, production of the siderophores? Yeah. Yeah, and for that matter, the resistance mm-hmm. to lipocalin. I do know that they are highly expressed, that the siderophores are highly expressed during infection in the urinary tract by a related bacterium, by uh, uropathogenic E. coli. And that's mm-hmm. work done um, here at Michigan, actually, by my chair, Harry Mobley, and all his Sorry. colleagues. Um, I don't know whether there are host signals that induce those pathways, or it's it's simpler. It's just when the bug needs iron, it induces its siderophores. I think that's the the standard paradigm. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't it doesn't matter for the conclusions of this this paper, but it'd be kind of curious. It'd be kind of interesting to know. Huh? They probably don't know. So their model is that this Nissel strain of E. coli is a sort of a surrogate for lipocalin two. It allows it tips the scales back to the host and uh, takes iron away from salmonella so it can't colonize as effectively. So they say E. coli initial is a beneficial microbe that sequesters nutrients from pathogens when the host fails to do so. Hmm. So it's really a beneficial microbe, and this is sort of one mechanism by which uh, it's doing that. I thought it was interesting because they have a, a discussion, and there's also an accompanying commentary where they talk about this, where lipocalin 2 is was previously considered to be a virulence trait, and whether some a bacterium could antagonize it or not was important for virulence. But you can see for this particular strain, the Nissel strain, it needs it in order to be beneficial. So it kind of changes our view of, of lipocalin, I guess. So, uh, Alia, you're—I sense you're a bit skeptical about uh, probiotics. What do you oh, think? God. What do you, th- <laughs> what do you think about this? I—I I, I better not say anything. Can I? <laughs> well, I don't know much about it. I mean, this is not my subject, but I know that the the idea has been around for so long since Mechnikov and Lactobacilli, and there doesn't seem to be a killer argument or a killer uh, evidence that this, that probiotics are the cure of intestinal disease. Um, it, it seems to me that it's sort of a hit and miss thing. There are indications that some strains, in some cases, do a lot of good, but the, the rules of probiotics are not obvious, is mm, really what yeah. I'm saying. You can't generate, um, Michelle. What do you think? Um, how do you feel about the fecal transplant literature, oh, where yeah. it's a little less delicate, but fecal matter from a healthy person is is given in a blender shake to someone who has um, unusually high levels of inflammation in their gut, and they get some relief. Yeah. Well. Can't argue with that. No, I, yeah, I don't. So- I don't deny the concept of probiotics. What I don't see happening is sort of a generalization or a guideline to indicate when it's appropriate, what bugs are appropriate for what. Right. There's just it's, it's all over the place. It's a scattered diagram, uh, and yeah, it's it's uh, probably okay. But uh, you know, just I, it's one of those things where. You, you would like a killer argument or something like that. Right. Well, the, as you know, the 
communities in our gut are incredibly complicated. Um, so it's been difficult to get at sure. in simple yeah. laboratory experiments. But now with the power of whole genome sequencing and the computer analysis that can go along with that to identify hmm. communities in your gut, I think we're, we're beginning to get some nice correlations between species yeah. that are pro-inflammatory and species that are anti-inflammatory. So mm -hmm. I personally can't wait for my next colonoscopy because I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to reseed with, you know, whatever the current literature says is the best bugs mm -hmm. <laughs> by changing my diet. So I'm optimistic that, that um, the basic research is going to um, make some progress, much as they have in this really beautiful model system um, yeah. with salmonella in the mouse. Yeah. No, I think you're right, and I I think that um, fecal transplant, as we know it, will probably not be used. What will be used is a gamish of bugs that have been studied, and each one right. identified as a consortium, because uh, a fecal transplant carries some risks. You know, my fecal flora may not be good for you. Right. And, uh, you know, so I, I think that, but that's likely to happen. I think people are doing exactly that. They're reconstructing a synthetic uh, feces for transplant. Yeah, many people are trying to do that. Yeah, uh, Michelle, did you see this article by Stan Falco about when he was young and doing a <laughs> fecal transplant somewhere? I, I haven't. So he, you should read it. It's I'll send it's you the blog. link. It's in it's in Alio's blog. That's right. He had um, Alio. Do you know the story briefly? Oh, he uh, uh, Stan Falco started life as a clinical microbiologist, and he was doing that. He and some clinicians were wondering about it, and so they made they got some gelatin capsules, filled them up with the feces of a patient, and after I think it was after antibiotic treatment, yeah. gave it back to them, and seemed to do some good. <laughs> he, he got fired. <laughs> Because <laughs> they didn't have an RB protocol or anything. Right, right. <laughs> oh, just did it. <laughs> and then he was hired back right away, but yeah. it's a long time ago. That's it, right. It's really a funny thing. I think this story is is nice because it puts a mechanism on one strain. You know, it's just one strain of a bacterium that, and they suggest that you could treat some uncomplicated salmonella infections with this strain. And you can imagine that maybe there'll be a clinical trial uh, to test that. Can I can I make a technical statement here, sure. a technical comment here? Uh, I was amazed at the nature of the the quantitation of the patho the histopathology. Mm -hmm. I would what they did is they made slides, uh, paraffin sections, I guess, of the uh, intestine, and gave it blindfolded to board certi certified pathologists and told them to score the lesions, one through four, and then added up the one through fours, so they had a scale from zero to 16. When you look at their numbers, they're really quite remarkable. They're very tightly bunched. And um, I was amazed that one could do that with histopathology, that one could see my quantitative in such a way that there's really a convincing result. I mean, it's just, it's just, just a technical point. I just didn't expect that. Maybe they have particularly good, keen histopathologists on board. Well, if you have a scoring system in place, yeah, then yeah. you can do. This is how the polio vaccines are tested. They, you know, they you infect a monkey in the spinal cord, and then after oh, three yeah. weeks, you make sections, and then pathologists score them on with very specific criteria, mm -hmm. and use that to calculate, you know, a, a virulence score, if you will. And uh, as regular microbiologists may not be aware of it, but yeah. This, so this, but this is very nice. This paper is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It is, and the images are quite striking. So. Um, some of the pathology sections that they show, I think even me as a microbiologist would be able to yeah. recognize which was which was the good one, the healthy one, and which was not. Yeah, the effects are very striking. It's a neat mm -hmm. story. So, Michelle, people study iron in your, your bacterium, Legionella? Um, they do, but actually I was going to uh, research done here at Michigan that is similar to what we've just talked about. Um, Harry Mobley, I mentioned, has mm -hmm. been studying iron acquisition for urinary tract pathogens, and he's applied genetics and found that the profile of siderophores or iron binding proteins made by uropathogenic E. coli really dictate whether they do best in the kidney or they do best in the bladder. Mm. So our host proteins that bind iron differ with di in different sites in the body. And so the siderophores that the bacterium needs to thrive in those different sites is also different. So they've been able to 
construct mutant strains that have one CDR4 but not another and find that they do better in one tissue but not another. And then similar work has been done by um, an assistant professor here, Michael Bachman, who, who trained at Penn with Jeff Weiser and is now continuing that work. And he's using Klebsiella, which is a um, mm. major hospital problem, uh, causes pneumonias as, among other diseases. And he too has found that the profile of siderophores made by Klebsiella dictate whether the pathogen grows well in the upper lobes of the lung versus in the bronchioles, et cetera. Mm. So, so there's really lovely work being done that parallels um, the findings in this study in the gut. All right. That's uh, the story, the battle of iron, as Michael would say. Let's move on to your uh, paper, Alio. Okay. My, the paper I'm going to discuss is called Horizontal Gene Transfer from Diverse bacteria to an insect genome enables a tripartite nested mealybug symbiosis. Now, obviously, this needs explaining. Uh, but first of all, the authors are a whole bunch. I won't read all their names, um, except to point out that it's quite an international consortium. It involves people from the Czech Republic, Japan, um, including uh, Okinawa, and um, several places in the United States, including Carol Van Dolan, who is at Utah State, and uh, John McCutcheon, who is at the University of Montana. Now, what's this all about? This is one of those ultra gee whiz stories. If you were to pick up a story that you want a, a microbiological story, you want to tell it at a cocktail party, this is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> There's no question about it. This is, why is that? Because... Not fecal transplants, Elio? Yeah, it's a good one too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it depends on your taste. <laughs> your friends. Your friends, yeah. Anyhow, the story here, which has been um, uh, around for a while, is that in the mealybugs, and what are mealybugs? Mealybugs are insect, insect pests, which uh, look mealy because they are like they're scale insects covered by wax, and the wax particles it looks like they've been rolled in wax. So anyhow, mealybugs are a quite widespread set of insects, and they are uh, they're a pest. Anyhow, like many insects, they carry endosymbionts. They carry endosymbionts in a specialized cell called the bacteriocyte, which sits someplace in the intestinal, in the digestive system of the insect. And it's there's lots of it, and most most insects have them. And in many cases, it's been shown that these endosymbionts, which are bacteria, are involved in providing the host with needed amino acids. Insects are like us. We don't make all the amino acids we need. We make about 10. And I think insects are about the same way. So they need the rest. But insects like aphids have a problem because they feed on sap. And plant sap is very rich in sugars. It's like drinking a sweet drink, but they're poor in amino acids. So where do they get their amino acids? And the answer is the insects supply the, um, the endosymbionts with uh, needed carbon compounds and energy, and the endosymbionts make the missing amino acids. It's like they know how to count to 10. The insects count 10 amino acids they can make and the, the, and the host count and not the other 10. Anyhow, that's been known for a long time. What's also been known by, was discovered by some people, but cleared up by Carol Van Dolen is that in the case of mealy, these particular citrus mealybugs, the endosymbionts have inside of them, guess what? Other bacteria. <laughs> so there are bugs within bugs within bugs. Okay. There are what do you call that? Within bacteria within an insect. Well, that's some kind of a doll, right? Some Russian. Like kind of a Russian doll, if you want. So every commentary commentator points that out. Anyhow, this is not, but let me say that it sounds unique. It's not totally unique because if you look all over, in natural environments, you find bacteria which carry bacteria within them. I mean, a model is Dello Vibrio, which is a pathogen, if you wish, a virulent bacterium that kills other bacteria. But there are others which can live as commensals. Little known fact and little appreciated fact. But in most cases, nobody knows anything about it. Obviously, this is different than ectosymbionts, the symbionts which are one is outside the other, of which there are, of course, very many. Now, these endo endosymbionts 
there's there's a really big story about this, and the big the reason for the big story comes out from bioinformatics, from knowing the genome of both let's call it the host bacterium and the endosymbiont of the endosymbiont bacterium, and also knowing part of the sequence of the aphid. And when you put all that together, you come out with the fact none of these three genomes, again, the genome of the mealybug, the genome of the big endosymbiont, and the genome of the endosymbiont within the endosymbiont, none of those can make all the amino acids. Okay, And so what happens is that they work as a, as a genetic... Consortium, that is, it takes all three to do it. Let me go over it a little bit. I don't know what words to call it. The endosymbiont will be the big big guy, and let's call it endosymbiont A, and endosymbiont B is the guy within A. We clear on that? Yep. Okay. Now, the uh, endosymbiont A is called Tremblaya, after somebody called Tremblay. It's a common name in French Canada, so I wonder if that's where it comes from. Anyhow... Uh, it has one of the, probably the smallest genome known, 139 KB. It's a beta proteobacterium, and it, it codes for about 120 genes, not nearly enough for life. It's called candidatus, by the way. Candidatus is a word which is plunked in front of a genus and species name for bacteria which can, have not yet been cultivated. Uh, I'm, I'm having a little side discussion about this with some of the famous taxonomists because I pointed out that a bug like Tremblaya will never be cultivated. Yeah. With 120 genes, there's no way on earth that you can ever cultivate it. So you're dooming it to this <laughs> uh, purgatory. You know, Taxonomic it's be oblivion. A forever, just like some graduate students we know, isn't it? <laughs> You've known some graduate students who are candidates forever, right? Sure, sure. Not not mine, of course. <laughs> no, no. They graduate <laughs> in about, what, three or four years. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anyhow, so they, they, this guy has problems. And the interesting part is that part of the problems are solved by having in the symbiont B, which is called Moranella, Moranella endobia, which is the endosymbiont of the endosymbiont. Moranella, known after Nancy Moran, who is one of the leading figures in the study of insect endosymbionts and other things, and dealing with lots of aspects of evolution. Moranella, oddly, has a genome which is about four times the size of its host. But, you know, that's just a curiosity. Anyhow, Moranella is inside of Tremblaya. B is inside of A. Now, uh, all this seems to be related to amino acid metabolism. No, not just amino acid metabolism. Purines and pyrimidines are involved in lots of other things as well. Now, the interesting part is that I, I said that there are genes of the endosymbiont A and genes of endosymbiont B and genes from the aphid. Now, the interesting part about the genes from the aphid which participate in amino acid biosynthesis are from all signs, acquired from other bacteria. In other words, they've been acquired by horizontal gene transfer, transfer from bacteria which are no longer there. Mm. And this is kind of fascinating. So there are three genes, three sets of genes or three genes, that come from the host, and those come from, there are several genes, come from di three different lineages, and the lineages are... Uh, Alpha protobacteria, beta, no, gamma protobacteria, and the bacteroidetes. So now you have genes in the nucleus which come from bacteria which are no longer there. The idea is that these guys may have been endosymbionts at one point, where they're long enough to transfer the genes to the nucleus and then disappear. Mm. Okay? So we have six genomes, three X bacterial genomes in the nucleus and Moranella and the Tremblaya. This is quite a rig. This is quite an amazing way of, of doing business. So what, what do we know about this? There's lots of details that come up. And this is a very, this is a wonderful paper, by the way. This is a paper that really becomes a novel classic. I really recommend it. It's a long paper and it's got quite a bit of detail. It's not easy. It's easy reading if you have infinite patience. <laughs> Anyhow. The various aspects of the story have to do with the peculiarities of the of the Tremblaya. Tremblaya, which is the A in the symbiont in my in my language, 
not only does it have the smallest number of genes of anything you can call a bacterium, but it also has the lowest, a very low coding density, 73%, which is very low. In other words, it's got a lot of junk. And in fact, it has 19 pseudogenes. Now, this is really weird because here is a bug with a tiny, tiny genome, and it doesn't even use more, all of it. It uses 73% of it. Like, it doesn't care. It just really, it can make do with even less. So you expect that maybe Tremblaya is on to a path of losing even more genes. It's on a reduction, genome reduction kick. And uh, in time, it will get rid of the pseudogenes and then have an even smaller genome, which is sort of remarkable. Now, um, the interesting story here is that they found that in the oat mealybug, it's a different mealybug than the citrus mealybug they've been studying, there is a different tremblaya. And this tremblaya does not have moranella in it. Mm. Okay? Only endosymbiont A, not B. And sure enough, it's quite a bit bigger. Mm. It has a larger genome. It has a 93% coding density. I don't know if it has any pseudogenes, whatever it has. And it's a similar tremblaya but what it, what it looks like is that a bigger tremblaya, like the one from the old mealybug, started life, and then Moranella came along. And Moranella told this tremblaya, get rid of some of your genes. You don't need them. Okay? And so they became a symbiosis that was an essential symbiosis. Mm. The old meal mealybug, by the way, has all the genes of both the tremblaya of the citrus mealybug and the Moranella. So it tells you that this is really very, very suggestive that when Moranella came along, Tremblaya shed many of his genes. So the oat, the oat may be an intermediate, right? At an intermediate stage? That's right, exactly. The oat may, is, it hasn't, it hasn't seen Moranella yet. It has to make do with a much more competent Tremblaya. So presumably at one point, as you say, Moranella entered Tremblaya, and then at that point, Tremblaya started to shed genes, right? Right. That's the idea. Okay. Now, the question is, do some of these genes end up in the nucleus? Because remember, mm. in the case of mitochondria and chloroplasts, uh, many, most of the genes were shed by the original endosymbiont and went to the nucleus. And the answer here is no. You don't find Tremblaya genes or Moranella genes in the nucleus. What you find is, in fact, these remnants of these potentially ex-symbionts, which came and went, and which uh, left behind some of the needed genes. So this is a very unique situation. And uh, everything about it is kind of unexpected. I don't think you could sort of dream this one up. So the, the, the mealybug has some, still some functional genes from exactly. other bacteria. And right? they're from three different bacteria. Yeah, that's but, bioinformatics, of course, but yeah. that's what... Yeah. And by the way, oh yeah, one lovely thing is that those genes are upregulated in the, in the bacteriocyte, in the cell which contains all the symbionts. In other words, the, in the cell of the insect, those genes are upregulated because that, that's what they're needed. Now, I think that's really neat. So do you really, do you really need Tremblaya? Couldn't, isn't Morinella enough? That's a good question. Yeah, well, no, because Moranella doesn't have all the genes. Uh, it has the complementary genes to Tremblaya, but not not the same one. So in Moranella, how many Tremblaya genes would it would be the minimum that Moranella would need? Oh, I I think it's a couple of dozen, something like that. Okay. I'm guessing. It's I don't a lot. Know. Yeah. Okay. It's not yeah. just a yeah. handful. It's not. Yeah. No, it's not. Man, I don't know. But uh, it's not. This is just not how it happened. But you're yeah. right. Yeah. But look, a Moranella, which has the Tremblaya genes, is like Wolbachia or Buchne rather Buchnera, which is a totally different endosymbiont, which is perfectly all right all by itself. Yeah. It supplies those ten needed amino acids fine. So it would become unrecognizable as an endo endosymbiont. It would just be a plain ordinary endosymbiont. Yeah. So uh, another aspect that I found fascinating is that in order to share gene products, there has to be secretion or there you have to get the products out of the cell. Yeah. And one of the solutions, which is fascinating to me, is that the, the insect has actually acquired some of the genes that the bacteria within them need to make their cell wall. 
So the mealy bug has control over how strong the cell wall is in these endosymbionts. Mm -hmm. And they have evidence that they can either increase the strength or decrease it. And by decreasing it, they increase lysis of the tiny endosymbiont, the, the morinella, which would then release its gene products to support the bacterium that itself is supporting the insect. Mm. So Isn't it, it's, very yeah. cool. it's a very cool, intricate uh, It is circuit. amazing. Uh, you yeah. should, we should say that Moranella does not have secretory, uh, secretory system that allow, would allow it to export the right. gene products. So, it doesn't, it can, it, it, so the only solution they can come up with is that it just commits suicide and lysis, mm. which is very altruistic of it. You're right. This is fascinating. So, uh, yeah, but the the evidence, I must say that the evidence for this happening is a little bit indirect. One of the things they see is that in some stages, the Moronella looks degenerate. It looks like it's going to break up. However, let me say that the morphology of endosymbionts is pretty messy. Many, many endosymbionts, they think they'd be tiny, tiny, tiny things because they have small genomes. Well, they get to be big balloon, sausage-shaped structures, several micron across. So the morphology is kind of a little bit tricky here. Mm -hmm. But you're, uh, still, it's the most likely mechanism is lysis of the moronella. Yeah. It's on. yeah. Deduced from the bioinformatics. Right. Yeah. When, whenever you see these kinds of relationships, I always wonder evolutionarily what was the sequence of events? Who was there first and who came next? You know, it's well, sometimes really difficult to imagine it. I also think it's worth pointing out the parallel with um, humans. So the human gut our humans are not able to make many vitamins. We rely on our diet and actually the bacteria that live in our gut to generate vitamins like vitamin K and vitamin B. So in a way, it's parallel. Humans no longer or cannot make certain vitamins. We rely on the bacteria within our gut to generate them for us. Mm -hmm. So we too have gaps in our metabolic pathway that are now complemented by the microbes that live within right. us. Yep. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful parallel but more complicated, obviously, in humans. Uh, Michelle, you, you put your finger on something. We often talk about very disparate papers that on the surface have no connection at all. Right. I mean, the, the story of Salmonella and E. coli and here of the endosymbiont seem to be unrelated. And yet, like you point out, there really is a pretty direct relationship. Thanks for bringing that up. It's yeah. really good. I actually would like to get on um, a soapbox here and make an editorial point also, <laughs> which is we talked today about two papers, one that was really pathogenesis and this one more symbiosis. Both of them rely heavily on understanding physiology and metabolism. And as Elio can probably um, appreciate better than I, in the early days of microbiology, there was, there was beautiful work being done on physiology, metabolism, enzymology. Once molecular biology came into play, certainly in the pathogenesis field, there was much more interest in toxins and adhesins and molecules you could, uh, proteins you could get your hands on and, and that could confer traits when transferred to other bacteria. But as we're able to now use more sophisticated methods and ask what functions are really critical for a pathogen during infection, Again and again and again, we're coming up with metabolic pathways. Mm -hmm. Central metabolism is really mm -hmm. critical. And unfortunately, we have not as a field been investing in that research. Um, it's underfunded. Fewer, fewer students are going into basic bacterial physiology. And yet now we understand, to understand pathogenesis, we really need sophisticated knowledge of that. So um, we need to, as a field, uh, reinvest um, in our research on, on physiology. And I think these two papers really um, illustrate how important that is. Uh, I think you're totally right. This is a very important point. Uh, the early days of pathogenesis consisted of picking the low-hanging fruit. Uh, toxins, exotoxins are kind of easy. Right. You, you have a protein, it, does, uh, it mimics the disease, you inject botulinum toxin into a mouse, it gets the equivalent of botulism. But that 
forget about the rest of the bug. The bug has got a beater. The bug has got a, maybe botulism is not the best example. But, uh, you know, staphylococcus that makes toxins, a cholera bacteria that makes toxins. It's an entity. It's a living entity. And everything it does to survive is part of pathogenesis. It's, it's not a, uh, just something that's a curiosity to be studied in the lab. It's exactly what happens in the real world. So you're absolutely right. And this it's, is it's a, part of the innate immune system, too, as we saw with the iron sequestration. So, right. Yep. Sure, sure. Well, I think it's, it's, the realization is beginning to happen. I mean, there's a number of people who are proponents of this point of view, and they're pretty vocal. So maybe, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, one last point. Yep. Compare and contrast these endosymbionts with organelles. Now, everybody makes this point and dismisses it, saying it's just words. Let's, let's not worry about it. I'm, I'm game, but let's worry about it for just a minute. Are these endosymbionts, how are these endosymbionts of insects like organelles? And the answer is, according to John McCutcheon, the senior author here, a resounding no. And the reason is uh, that they look different, they act different, their properties are different. But um, I must say, it's it's not clear to me whether, in fact, these endosymbionts are not an example of a later day acquisition of organelles. In other words, you you could argue about it, but. It doesn't matter, you know, these are just words in a sense, or it's a side issue, but it's it's fun to contemplate it. I was thinking maybe an organelle can be defined as being present in every cell. Well, that's true for mitochondria, but I looked it up. It's obviously not true for chloroplasts. Mm. Uh, chloroplasts uh, in an onion root tip doesn't have chloroplasts. So the chloroplasts are organelles which are there sometimes, that they are in all the green parts of a plant. But mitochondria are there, I think, in everything except giardia and a few uh, strange organisms. But so the definition of what is an organelle and what is an endosymbiont is probably a little bit murky. And kind of fun. It's kind of fun to contemplate, I think. So if uh, people want to hear more about this, we actually discussed an earlier paper in this uh, mealybug story on TWIM 17, which was called Debugging Endosymbiosis. We talked, oh, yeah, we yeah. talked about the metabolic patchwork involved. They went into the details of who supplies what uh, in this relationship. And I was just looking at the paper. They have a wonderful table in that paper where they have a list of, of organisms in genome sizes. And the smallest is Tremblaya, 138,000 base pairs encoding 140 genes. Yeah. And so Aleo, s somewhat fewer than 140 are needed by Morinella. And that's the question, how many exactly? We don't but know. Moranella has four times as many genes. Moranella has 452 genes, right? right. It's, its genome is half a million base pairs, and of course E. coli is 4 million base right. pairs with 4,440 genes. And I just want to point out to, to everyone, a, a virus was just discovered, uh, a virus that infects amoeba that has a genome of 2.5 million <laughs> base pairs of DNA approaching the size of E. coli, bigger than rickettsia. And this is a virus called Pandora virus. It's full there of is no such thing. What's that? There is no such thing. That's Pandora. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, there'd be no okay, Pandora. Be. This, is, this defies the imagination, doesn't it? It does. Two and a half million bases, thousands of genes in a virus. And it wow. still can't replicate on its own, It cannot. Huh? It cannot. It cannot That's replicate. That's amazing. But the, yeah. the most interesting thing for me is that about 10% of those genes are completely brand new. No one has ever seen anything like them before. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. No motifs, no uh, any kind of protein signature that would say it's this or that. I think that's amazing. Now, you guys over at Twim, TWIV must have a field, a field day with all this stuff. Have you discussed it already? Or we have not to? done this one yet. We will in a couple of weeks okay. for, sure, is it, for sure. Is it very promiscuous? Does it have a broad host range? The only host they use is amoeba. And but so I don't know. They haven't looked. It's a good question. How many different amoeba? Yeah. Yeah, they use Castellani mm -hmm. always to isolate and propagate these big viruses. And that's a good question, whether these are unique to amoeba or can they infect other organisms. Recently, one of the um, 
one of these big viruses that infects amoeba was isolated from a patient with uh, a respiratory yeah. illness. Yeah. A meme virus, right? A meme like virus, so it could be that they infect human cells. Yeah. So we'll see. So gee whiz yeah, it is, is the whiz. order of the day, right? Really? Yeah, Nothing there's a lot of there's story. a lot of G whiz in microbiology. There is and, an uh, so again, if you're looking for a topic to dazzle your fellow men with, look at microbiology. For and sure. Here's the next cocktail party. And that's our job here on Twim is to get the G whiz out to everybody. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes it's not hard, not easy to find. All right, we have a couple of emails I'd like to read from listeners. The first one is from Nate, who writes. Hi, my name is Nate. I'm a senior in high school aspiring to become a microbiologist. Hey. I heard about this podcast through a class I took on biotechnology and have been listening for about two months. I really enjoy it and the other two shows, even if I don't quite understand everything you talk about, but I grasp most things. So a few weeks ago, I attended a biotechnology summer academy for high school students where we study one certain topic for three weeks with a professor at the college I was at. My subject was about the microbes that make up the stromatolites in the Great Salt Lake and, hey. why and why it's important that we understand it. I learned that they are made of cyanobacteria and certain types of archaea. The cyanobacteria don't really make sense because they don't have a very high salinity tolerance, especially as high as the GSL, Great Salt Lake, which is 33% at parts of the lake, but yet they are there. I also learned that the rock is formed by the waste of the microbes, which is calcium carbonate. These rocks have the potential to help with global warming. I'm not saying that I agree with the idea of global warming or not, but it is happening a little bit. So that brings up the question, <laughs> can we harvest and grow these rocks in a lab until they are big enough to put into the wild to catch some of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? I would like to hear your input on this subject, as I didn't have a lot of time at the academy to study it. Thanks. Gee, Nate, you ask good questions. So I sent, I sent Nate's email to Hazel Barton. Oh, great. And she said, actually, this is a pretty good question. And a number of folks have thought about microbial CO2 sequestration in just this way. Many of the carbonate rock deposits, limestone from about 360 plus million years ago, were formed during high periods of CO2. And we believe the CO2 was sequestered as rock by microbial activity. It dropped the atmospheric CO2 levels and preserved it in a form that is obviously stable over geologic time scales. The problem we have today is the ion. To precipitate CO2 as carbonate, you need a divalent ion. In the ancient oceans, there was plenty of calcium around, so it was depositive as, as calcium carbonate, limestone. Unfortunately, that easy source of calcium has been exhausted, so the problem comes in generating the ion for the carbonate to precipitate takes quite a bit of energy to do synthetically, so there's no net loss of greenhouse gases. If someone could come up with a handy ion generated from a more passive process, such as decomposition in garbage, then we could certainly sequester CO2 this way. A good PhD project. The stromatolite question is quite a bit more complicated and has to do with the saturation index of carbonates in seawater when the carbon dioxide levels drop from photosynthesis. I can elaborate on that more if you need, but the ion is still problematic. It's Hazel Barton, who was on TWIM a couple of months ago. It's a great question for a high school student, isn't it? Yeah. I'd, I'd love that high school students listen, or some of them do anyway. I think that's really great. Our next question is from Jim, our friend in Virginia, who writes, this Google Plus community knocks off socks when just skimming through the photos' captions. Don't want anyone to overlook it. So it is a community on Google Plus, it's called Advances in Medicine and Biology, and the photographs are just gorgeous. If you just click on the link that we're going to put in our show notes, you will see just beautiful pictures from all sorts of uh, areas of medicine and, and so forth. So thanks for sharing that, Jim. Uh, Robert writes in TWIM number 60, Michael Schmidt suggests that glucose for fermentation from biomass is a necessary step in production of fuel ethanol. Fuel ethanol and other low molecular weight compounds can also be produced by autotrophic anaerobic fermentation of syngas. Syngas is a mixture of carbon dioxide, sorry, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen produced by pyroclastic treatment of a wide variety of organic material, including lignocellulose, recycled tires, sewage sludge, 
and natural gas or methane. These reactions have been studied for many years and are being commercialized by Coscata. Never underestimate the ability of microbes to scrounge a living from nearly any environment with water and energy available. Do either of you know anything about Syngas? I do not. I don't, for sure. No, I don't. Well, we'll have to get Michael next time to tell us. He can tell us. He'll know. And finally, from Jesse. Uh, Jesse is the person behind another podcast at ASM Bacteriophiles. He writes, hello, Twim team. Thank you for the hours of entertainment and education you provide. I have a somewhat morbid question for you that's fairly random. I forget what inspired it exactly, but it has been bugging me. Normally, when an animal dies, it decays. But what happens if that animal is totally free from all microbes? So what happens if a germ-free mouse dies in a sterile environment and no one disposes of it for a while? Does it just decay somehow or just dry out maybe? Thanks again for all you do, Jesse. Boy, that's a good question. Uh, there are lots of cathepsins, there are lots of hydrolytic proteases in in the body that are dormant, and I suspect that there would be a fair amount of liquefaction in time due to endogenous uh, mm-hmm. proteases. What do you think? Whatever happens, I'm sure it's not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would agree. Right, yeah. right. I think you're right. There's going to be auto-digestion, and eventually it will dry out, too. Yeah, eventually. The, the skin will probably be left behind and, uh, you know, will be mummified to some extent. Unfortunately, this... Maybe one of our listeners has inadvertently done this yeah. experiment and could write in and tell us just what happened. Yeah, that's right. If you have a germ-free colony, you know, forgot the one dead mouse in the corner, you come back in six months, what happened? Yeah, yeah <laughs> the problem is they don't just sit there because uh, someone cleans them up, but maybe someone's done it. So let us know. But I would guess you're right, Leo. Eventually it's going to liquefy and dry up. Evaporate. And then you have the bones left. When I uh, lived in Boston, I was a postdoc up in Boston. I was there for three years or so. And when I left, I moved a piece of furniture and underneath it was a perfect mouse skeleton sitting on the rug. <laughs> with the tail and all the vertebrae perfectly aligned still. So it had died and totally... All the flesh was gone. I don't know what happened to it. Some Something else must have eaten it, I suppose. It was just clean bones. It was amazing. Maybe it was germ-free because at Harvard, everything is so clean. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> and and thinking back, you don't remember a stench that lasted, you know, a couple of weeks? No? <laughs> no, you know, I wasn't home all that much. I years before. I guess not. <laughs> As you know, Michelle, I wasn't home very much. Um, I was a postdoc. <laughs> And I don't remember anything at all. And you would think that at some point it would have been a smell. But I, I just, I was amazed. And I should have taken a picture, but I, we didn't have cell phones back then. So right, it's, it was just beautiful. It was a beautiful skeleton. And I left it there for the next occupant. <laughs> I didn't want to pick it up. And that will do it for TWIM61. You can find us at iTunes and also at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. And if you like what we do, Uh, please go over to iTunes and rate the show. Maybe leave a comment if you have time. That helps to keep us very visible over in the iTunes podcast directory. And we love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twim at twiv.tv. Michelle Swanson with one L is at the University of Michigan. Thanks for joining us, Michelle. My pleasure. Hope you enjoyed it. I did. Great papers. They are. Really good papers. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. Oh, it was fun as always. I'm going to miss you guys for a month. And this will be your last swim until September, right? That's right. Have a good vacation. Thank you. Thank oh, you. you will take photographs, right? No, I don't because after having done it for a lifetime, I realized I hardly ever look at them after the first time. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I can go to Google and find the better ones. <laughs> All right. Well, have a fun and safe trip. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Chris Kandian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. And the music... It's superb, by the way. It's it superb. is. It is wonderful. Couldn't do it without them. 
The music you hear on TWIM at the beginning and the end is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.